So my work is really focused on tobacco use, especially cigarettes, in youth. And my interest in this started when I was studying teens in treatment for substance abuse. That becomes clear to anyone who goes to a treatment center that most of those teens smoke. And we know that about 90% of teens who get treatment for alcohol and drug use are cigarette smokers. And one of the concerns about that is that while they may have success in their recovery from alcohol and other drugs, odds are that they're going to continue smoking and that that ultimately is their greatest risk for disease and for dying in the long run. We know that the founders of AA both died from tobacco-related disease. So um, recovery from alcohol and drugs is important and wonderful, but um, nicotine is a drug that is just as important to address for long-term health and well-being. So some of the things that we've done in our studies have looked at what happens over time um, with cigarette smoking in teens who've been through treatment. And we find that typically teens who smoke when they're in treatment will continue smoking for a long time afterwards. And not surprisingly, those who do better in their recovery are more likely to stop smoking. But even those eight years later, when they're in their mid-20s, are much more likely to be smokers than people in the general population. So 40% of these teens who are now young adults will smoke compared to about 20% of adults nationally. And those who continue to use alcohol and drugs um, continue smoking at very high rates. So this is a long-term concern. And some of these findings motivated me to take a look at, well, can we do something to help address tobacco use in the context of treatment? Um, and that's a difficult issue to address. There are a lot of barriers to talking about tobacco use as a drug in alcohol and drug treatment programs. There's a number of issues that have come up. Uh, one is that the lore in recovery is that it's important to take one thing at a time and that people are often encouraged to wait before they try to address other addictions beyond alcohol and drugs. So it's very common to get the message that, well, you shouldn't worry about that right now. Um, another is that many people who work in treatment facilities are recovering alcoholics and addicts, and they're much more likely to smoke than, again, folks in the general population. So because of their own smoking, they may be reluctant or uncomfortable addressing tobacco use among their patients. So these are structural barriers to addressing the issue um, that have made it challenging over the years. But whereas 20 years ago, essentially none of the treatment programs, whether for youth or for adults, addressed tobacco use, today it's much more common that these programs um, will either offer treatment or at least address the behavior in some way. But we still have a long way to go to reach the point where it's universally um, viewed as an unacceptable behavior and a drug addiction that ultimately has equally detrimental consequences those of alcohol and drugs. While the problems from alcohol and drugs happen more quickly, they can be devastating in the short term. The long-term costs of, of smoking are equally um, negative and powerful. People die. And I see this every day when I work with veterans who are in our alcohol and drug treatment program. Again, the majority of them smoke. And I see them when they're in their 50s and 60s, and now they have um, lung disease, cancers, and even if they're sober, they're still experiencing a lot of the health consequences from 40 years of smoking. So I think it's important to address this issue with youth early on. It's easier to quit when you're young than when you're middle-aged, certainly. Um, so at the time, this was about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to address smoking in a group of kids who'd been through alcohol and drug treatment. And at that point, we didn't really know much about helping teens quit smoking. And so we sort of tried to develop an intervention that would work for this population. And um, the first lesson I learned was that teens really don't want you to talk to them about their smoking. And if you offer them a program, they're not typically going to show up voluntarily. And that's a problem that we have generally with, with teen smoking. It's very hard to get youth to come into treatment voluntarily. And so the solution to that was to build in a tobacco cessation component or piece 
into existing programs, which was really the only way that I could run my study. So what we did was we offered this treatment to the setting, and everyone who smoked was supposed to attend. And then we studied those who volunteered to participate in the research part of it. Um, but what we did was try to address it from a perspective that's consistent with how teens um, view behavior change and, and what's important to them. And one piece of that was rather than saying, you have to quit smoking, um, we approached it as, a, as an educational experience that we just want you to come here and learn about this issue and you can choose what to do with it. You can do nothing, you can try to quit, you can do anything in the middle, we don't really care. Um, just participate and see what you can get out of it. Because it's very important to let um, young people set their own goals. Um, and when they're imposed on them, they tend not to respond very well to that, as most parents <laughs> are well aware of. Um, and so we had a group that lasted six weeks. We taught them ways to cope with the urges to smoke, to deal with their cravings, um, what they needed to do if they wanted to change the behavior, how to stay quit. And we found that of those who got the treatment, um, those were much more likely to have quit smoking and stayed quit than the teens who didn't get any treatment at all. And this was about three months after they had finished our program. By six months later, there was, wasn't really much different, which is pretty commonly what you find in, when you address these kind of behaviors, that in the short term, there are changes. In the long term, um, it's difficult to maintain the behavior change. But if we think back to some of the barriers to quitting, um, especially for youth, that a lot of their smoking depends on their peer group, the social setting in which they participate. And so we know that youth in recovery smoke at very high rates. And if you go to meetings for AA meetings or NA meetings, that most of the people who attend those meetings are smokers. And so it's very difficult to stop smoking in a, in, in a setting where you're constantly being exposed to the behavior. And really it's being reinforced and um, the attitudes of your peer group are positive towards it. So in a sense, we need to change the culture of the recovery community to consider smoking to be an unacceptable behavior. Until that happens, we're always going to be fighting an uphill battle. And the comparison is to look at what's happened in our country over the last 30 years, as smoking has been addressed both by policies and laws and regulations, that we've cut the rate of smoking by half since the programs started um, to address tobacco use in our population. And today, especially in California, smoking isn't an acceptable behavior. And many people that come to my clinic in the, vet the veterans hospital, they want to quit because they feel like they're stigmatized, they're, they feel like outcasts, that they have to hide their smoking. And they basically get tired of that. And that's great, because that's exactly what we want to do. We want to have our environment not support the behavior. But with teens, it's very difficult to, to create that kind of environment. And that's part of the challenge that we have. And so in the in the context of teens who get treatment for alcohol and drug use, um, teens in the recovery community, it's going to be really important that these facilities and organizations adopt the perspective that tobacco use is a drug, and as part of recovery, it's important to address that behavior along with alcohol and other drug use. And we're moving in that direction, but we still have a ways to go. I think an important and encouraging thing to keep in mind is that there are a number of studies with both adults and adolescents who've either had alcohol and drug problems or have been treated for them, that those who, who do best with their recovery are more likely to stop smoking. And if you look at it the other way around, those who stop smoking tend to do better with their recovery. And I think what's more interesting is that there are a number of studies, um, including my study, where we found that um, teens who got our tobacco intervention actually had better alcohol and drug use outcomes down the road than the teens who didn't. And there's some findings in adult studies that show the same thing, that just receiving tobacco intervention, even if it doesn't have a huge effect on their smoking, seems to um, improve outcomes for alcohol and drug use. So the message there is that it might be that addressing tobacco use in the course of treatment for alcohol and drug problems 
actually has a positive effect on recovery for alcohol and drugs. So that's good news and really argues for the importance of building this piece into our existing treatments. Um, even if it doesn't have as much of an effect on smoking as we'd like, it may actually help um, alcohol and drug use recovery.